love. Some would say it took a backseat when the pandemic forced us apart. As a family-run and proudly Canadian-owned company, Charm Diamond Centres saw the need to bring us together with tales of love and created the Canadian Love Map podcast. Since then, we've shared hundreds of real, uplifting stories that prove love conquers all. So thank you for listening. We couldn't do it without you. And remember, love starts here. What the world needs now is love. More love. Stars literally aligned. He's always been the one. There's someone out there for everyone. I'm Nancy Regan, your host on the Canadian Love Map. We are on a journey to uncover and share love stories of all kinds. He's never forgotten to bring me flowers. We're hoping we're going to give a little good news to this world. Even in these dark times, the life continues to go on. It's all about compassion, devotion, adventure, and of course, love. Everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs love. This is the Canadian Love Map. Well, love is the most important thing. So we had an ultimatum to leave within like 12 hours. Within the 12 hours, my life changed. So I went from being a normal kid, having a normal life, to being homeless. <laughs> Canadians have built us piece by piece from the ground up. And with that came also healing. Today's love story belongs to Arta Rexhepi. Recently, Arta organized a remarkable event at Halifax's Pier 21 called Operation Parasol, the same name as the refugee operation 25 years ago that brought her and so many others from war-torn Kosovo to safety in Canada. At this momentous gathering, which drew 500 people from across Canada and abroad, Arta, a journalist, premiered her documentary that tells the human story of this dark chapter of history. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. Arta is also a vibrant example of how, out of the darkness, grew an extraordinary community that celebrates Canada Day with a whole different perspective. This is the Canadian Love Map. Arta, welcome to the Canadian Love Map. Thank you so much for having me. And happy Canada Day. Same to you. I am so excited that you are our very special guest for this very special week because you represent something that is so important to Canada and, and what Canada is or should be. So let's, can we just dive into your story? Absolutely. What does Canada Day mean for you? Pride. Um proud to be a Canadian, even though I wasn't born here. Canada is my new home. My kids are born here. And, um, you know, we Canada gave us a second chance uh, of a new life and a new beginning. And I have only positive uh, views of Canada besides paying a lot of taxes. <laughs> but, uh, you ah, know. Yes, there's that. <laughs> You mentioned your children being born here. Can we go back to when you were a child? Set the scene for us and, and just to explain what your childhood was like and where. Uh, so I was born in Kosovo um, before the war. And so I had a pretty privileged, I guess, childhood. My dad was an artist. Um, my mom was a musician. You know, it was a fun childhood. You know, I was uh, the artist's daughter and everybody liked us and we had a lot of fun and had a big, big family. I was like this shy girl, this geek, geeky. And in my town, I was like the only left-handed person and everyone would compare me to Bill Clinton because <laughs> uh, there was no left-handed people in there. I was like the only one. And, and then... That's when everybody got like this addiction toward me <laughs> for some reason. And it's still to this day, people are feel that way. <laughs> they are attracted to you like a magnet, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> How prevalent was North America sort of looming in your life then in Kosovo as a child? People, uh, especially in Kosovo, always had this love 
for North North America because of the freedoms and um, really uh, be, being able to be yourself and express. And that was very important, um, especially as I said, you know, my parents were artists and uh, Kosovo was at a time where, you know, there was still a lot of, um, the community was very primitive in a way. And so my mom broke a lot of rules, social norms, and, uh, you know, my parents really worked toward ex- self-expression a lot. And all of my dad's artwork, even then, were uh, a lot of uh, very nationalist about Kosovo, but as well as, uh, you know, having the freedom to express yourself. Um, because during, like, early 90s, people of Kosovo were not even allowed to, to freely to express their point of views, the freedom of expression was not really an option. Uh, People were oppressed and even prisoned to just, even by speaking uh, their language, by just being, you know, who we were as Albanians. And uh, that's what drew the war. Do you remember as a child thinking your parents were brave because they were so liberated with their self-expression? Yes, especially my mom. Uh, she was very brave. <laughs> she was not your typical Albanian woman, I guess. So there's four girls in our family and two boys. My parents were always feminist. <laughs> and my mom was like playing in theater when most wo- women uh, didn't even have the right to go to school. And she was uh, singing in theater and acting. And I thought that was really cool. And so I guess uh, I still have that opinion about my mom, especially now. I'm like, oh, wow, that that was actually more bold than I thought she was. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You realize within adult (laughs) eyes. Absolutely. Take me back, if you will, to when the war started. And if there are any questions I ask that you have a reaction and think, I don't want to go there or it's too painful or I just don't want to for any reason talk about that. I Please, I am giving you full permission to hold your own boundaries. And I am so appreciative that you're willing to talk about this because it's, there's a lot of trauma. Absolutely. I I think the best way that we can heal trauma is by talking about it. And, um, most uh, Kosovo refugees still have a lot of trauma because they shy away from talking about it and they shy away from opening those wounds because they are very hurtful. Um, My parents have always made me feel comfortable to, um, especially my dad, uh, he always made me feel very comfortable in expressing myself and especially being an artist. Um, I, I always had an interest in the stories of his artwork so er- people would be like uh, interested visually but I would always be interested in the story behind every piece of work and so uh, with his art he he really also helped us uh, heal that trauma you know using art therapy um, as a way of healing the trauma of the war so I don't I've come to a point where I find that speaking doesn't really hurt me anymore about it because I realize, you know, when war happens, sometimes it has to happen to get your freedom, right? Mm-hmm. So the price of that war was some really bad things. And with age, you realize that sometimes some things have to happen for a better result. Tell me then, uh, because you have expressed so beautifully why you're willing to use your voice and and bring your memories out into the light. What was it like for you when the war broke out? I mean, as a preteen slash teenager, um, I was just like, why is this happening? You know, why why it's happening to us? And then basically every day I, I woke up knowing that I had a very chance of meeting God the next day I meet the love. I was prepared to to die because you didn't really know what's going to happen the next day if you're going to live or not. Um, It's kind of the reality of war. And I was just like hoping that my little sister would be saved. I was like, I don't care for myself. Our region was still untouched. It first started in other parts of Kosovo. And 
we also hosted some refugees from other parts of Kosovo and just the things we were seeing were horrific. Of course, my parents tried to keep me keep us away from watching, but I was, I guess, very interested in world events and cared to know the story. I wanted to, to know the story and, you know, what was happening. And it was just like this fear of, you know, what's why is this happening? More so my... I was like more, not really fear, but because I think I was always <laughs> fearless. Uh, but um, really? I think it was just more of like why that's not fair, the in- inequality and not understanding why ethnic cleansing was taking place in the heart of Europe. What did your parents tell you about ethnic cleansing? Like, How do you explain that to children? I mean, my, my my dad really tried everything to not talk, at first, not talk about the war. He would, like, play his violin and get us to paint, try to do everything about the war. Um, we learned in school uh, our history was always troubling, so we kind of, our parents really have to explain to us because we already knew, uh, you know, what was happening in Bosnia, they were just like, same as Bosnia, really. Oh, right. Because it was like Bosnia and then we were next. How quickly did your world shift? Physically, not very qu- quickly, but mentally, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it affected us. Uh, we were still going to school and being still normal. Uh, when we got the ultimatum though, um, so we had an ultimatum to leave within like 12 hours or they wanted us to protest um, against NATO's air bombing campaign, either that or leave. And we weren't willing to do that. So we left. Within the 12 hours, my life changed. So I went from being a normal kid having a normal life to being homeless <laughs> and to like losing everything within 12 hours. I think for me, because houses get burned in fires, we see that happen here all the day. But I think the hurt for me was that it was um, arson. It was intentional. It was, um, you know, the artwork, uh, the musical instruments. For some reason, uh, the artistic parts were more hurtful like the loss of the creative things we had in the house and all the like material things that we had. Well, it was such a visual representation of how they were destroying your life, your home, your security, your the love that had gone into all of that artwork and the music. Yeah, and uh, our house, uh, I think they knew about my family I'm not sure because our house was the very first one to go like we hadn't even left yet we were just like in our vehicles and it was like the very first one to go up in flames and um, it it also like boasted like it was like different than most houses because it was like very North American type of features and of course they didn't like that (laughs) Um, So that was probably also triggering. But yeah, it was the very first one to go. And it was like, we hadn't even left yet. It was like up in flames. I remember the smoke. And then I just produced a documentary for the event for the 25 years. And for the very first time, someone from my town heard that I was producing it. And apparently they had some footage of our house, um, like right after the war. And they sent me the footage, and and on the opening scene is our, I put that on the documentary. Um, oh. I was like, wow! After twenty five years, I get to see this. Uh, that's really like, it's sad, but it's kind of cool that the footage exists somewhere. Can you even describe how you felt when you saw it? I feel like for the first time in twenty five years. It was like that missing piece of my story because I always wondered, right? I feel like I was able to like heal maybe in a major way and being able to fully understand, be like, okay, this is what happened. I'm willing to accept what happened as part of us, you know, as part of our resolution. And um, it did, I guess, help me in a way to just 
put the closing piece to my story in a way. I'm I'm in an awkward moment because I'm crying and you are the one who's gone through this horrific life event, but it's not just compassion, it's it's me witnessing your courageous and open heart. So that makes me emotional. I mean, as as I said in the beginning, uh, Canadians have built us um, piece by piece from the ground up. And with that came also healing, healing us from the traumas that we've experienced and being able to freely talk as I am right now. Um, I know it's a privilege that not anybody has, not in every country, not in, especially as a woman, um, a lot may shy away, you know, um, but I'm the bold. <laughs> the You're bold. the bold one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's more difficult for women still in, in Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo ha- women have uh, really evolved. The side has really evolved after the war. But in some rural areas, they would never be able to speak um, as we had at the event. Only two out of um, 20,000 uh, allegedly um, raped based on the records from, from the Kosovo government has, only two have come forward and one of them lives in Canada because of you know Canada giving her the voice and one from the G- United States. So really, uh, there hasn't been one single woman in Kosovo that has gone public and been like, uh, I was one of the victims. Um, it's like a war uh, for them. It's it's a war after the war because there's stigma in the community. There's you know uh, the victim shaming, the victim blaming, and it's like we're in a way we're really helping the perpetrators uh, by uh, lowering their voices, by silencing their voices, and um, the event in Halifax was uh, it was the first event the one from Alberta that she did uh, in Canada for the very first time publicly. And, you know, it's a very courageous thing to do. And uh, there's mothers still uh, setting the table for their children to come home because they don't know where their bodies are because Serbia continues to withhold uh, the information of um, unmarked graves. Uh, There's still nearly 2,000, I believe, um, missing people that have not been accounted for. And it's part of that closure, right? Um, 25 years later, like how do we move on to a peaceful um, negotiation when we do not have the closure yet? When they haven't stepped up to to say, yes, our previous politicians did this and that, and we, we are sorry what happened in the past. We are sorry for the war crimes. But we are willing to move forward as as neighbors. But no, they 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 continue to um, deny the war crimes. Never mind compensate Kosovo, and not give those families the closure. Not getting closure is really the worst thing anybody can experience. And we have a, a girl in Toronto. Uh, she still has no idea where her brother and her sister are. I spoke to her like uh, two weeks ago. She was like. Earth, that we just want to know where their bodies are, lay them to rest, and have that peace in our family. Because she's like, every day we don't have that peace in our family because we don't know. It's the unknown, right? And um, it, it's really it is unfortunate. And, and um, you know, instead of uh, us, both countries moving forward, it's always back and forth, all this, you know, drama. And unless we can start um, a reconciliation process, it's going to be another 100 years and we're still going to be fighting back and forth. And something has to change. And it needs to start by Serbia really acknowledging, apologizing, being like, you know what, we we are sorry, but we want to make it better for the future because we are neighbors. It's just like the politicians, the leaders, because normal people, uh, Albanians and, uh, and the Serbians, don't really hate each other. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, we need to find a resolution po- politically to find, you know, the middle ground, right? 
we couldn't share the great stories that we do here on the Canadian Love Map podcast without the amazing support of Charm Diamond Centres. They are Canada's largest family-owned jeweler, and they're proud to be putting love on the map. The folks at Charm Diamond Centres are thrilled to be a part of your love story. So visit CharmDiamondCenters.com or one of your local stores. Love starts here. It's, it's hard to move on from this part of the conversation because what you describe is happening so many places in the world right now. There is Absolutely. so much. And it's very unfortunate. Violence. And it's so unfortunate. And I mean, it, unfortunate doesn't, as you know, it, it's such a silly word in yeah. comparison to what we're talking about, I know. Yeah. But I do want to talk to you about your journey once you knew you were coming to Canada. And I'd like to know how you went from that horrific scene of watching your house burn down to knowing that you were coming to safety in Canada. Yeah, I mean, when we came to Canada, it was really, we were just like, oh, it's just temporary <laughs> mm -hmm. um, until the war ends. And how we came, we weren't initially going to leave even though it was a refugee camp, we would have rather just stayed at a refugee camp than go to a new country. We went to Macedonia. We, we stayed at the border for two days, and then we stayed at the re refugee camp in Stankovets uh, for six weeks. We were lucky because there's people who've been for a year at a refugee camp. And then Canada started... Um, answering the call um, to accept refugees. And we weren't even going to sign up, but my brother got sick and my sister got sick. And that's when my parents were like, okay, we have to try and get out uh, because these kids are getting sick. What was it like when you were presented with that option? Was it an option? Or did they say you're going to Canada? Uh, presumably they asked you, do you want to take this so my dad, yeah. So my dad signed up, and we didn't really know that we were accepted for Canada. And then a night before, these ladies came at like 10 p.m. We're like, "Are you guys freeing your tent? Because uh, we need a tent, and you guys are leaving for Canada." We're like, "Really?" And then my dad ran and checked our name was on the list. We had no idea. Oof. And then so we just like got ready overnight and next morning we boarded boarded a, a bus and then were sent to the uh, uh, Skopje airport and then came to Canada. What do you remember about landing in Canada? Um, it was pretty awesome. It was uh, surprising, I guess, because um, Canadians were very welcoming. Um, they were giving us uh, the Zeddy Bears and giving us Canadian flags. And everyone was very, very nice. And um, it was unexpected, you know, to get that kindness because um, going from a refugee camp where the officers were a bit stern, you know, because they had an overwhelming number of refugees trying to handle, right? Mm -hmm. And then coming to here and then seeing everyone was like, kind and peaceful it's like oh this is unlike anything i've seen before <laughs> how old were you when you landed 13 and do you remember what was going through your head standing in the airport yeah i was like uh okay this is just gonna be temporary i was like oh this is peace even though it was so peaceful and all that i don't really want to be here i was like kind of mad at my parents <laughs> But I, I knew we had to come because my my siblings were sick. And then I was like, okay, it's just for a little while. But then the Canadians warmed our hearts, um, the way they treated us, the way they uh, made us feel. Even though we were refugees, they didn't make us feel like refugees. They made us feel like part of the community and part of being Canadian. We felt just as Canadian as anybody else, really. So we stayed at the Windsor Park um, military base um, in Halifax for nearly two months. And they even set up a studio for my dad to paint. So my dad got a lot of art pieces still today. 
that he painted during those days. And you can see in his artwork, the early days um, and his art is like very, you can see the war in there. And then the later pieces, they're all like light and peaceful and just you can really tell uh, just by looking at the pictures which ones are from the, the, the early days. So it's like you can see your family's journey through your father's art. Yes, absolutely. What kind of culture shock did you have? The culture shock was really um, mostly for the adults. The kids, we went to school, we became integrated really quickly. Mm. And that made us heal better. And even at the event, I found that um, the adults had more trauma than the kids because I think for the kids, they got, you know, uh, Canadian friends, they went to school, they had community leaders work with them, teachers, schools, and the kids, I think, also got more of the professional help in a way, mm -hmm. uh, so more healed. Uh, but the cultural shock was really, Albanians have always been very, you know, pride of their culture, so they did everything to try and keep their culture anything. It was very hard for Kosovo refugees to let blending of the cultures in. I think they uh, felt, a lot of them, that, oh, if this happens, our identity is going to be lost. Um, but th the way I describe our identity now is really a blend. It's like a cocktail of two cultures. So we have the good sides of the Albanians uh, culture and the Canadian culture, and it's it's like this new, unique identity. But there was a lot of fear within the Albanian community of letting go. A lot of them still have this fear that if that happens, my world is going to crash. It's like extinction. Yeah. I'm soaking in what you're saying, and it's so deeply meaningful. And it speaks to the experience of so many people, not just from Kosovo, but so many people who have come to Canada absolutely, uh, as immigrants and particularly as refugees. And I, I would like to ask you about the word refugee and what you, what you think about that word. For many refugees, the word refugee is finding peace in a new country finding home safety and freedom of oppression, freedom of um, expression and all of that. But obviously uh, for me personally, I will always be known as Arta, the, the refugee mm -hmm. and, <laughs> or the artist's daughter, one of those two. Yeah. And yes, you know, there's been times where I'd wonder if, um, if I wasn't a refugee, would I still be a journalist? If I wasn't a refugee, a refugee, would I still be telling these stories? Who would I be? What would my identity be? But I stopped doing that because when you go, what if this, what if that, it's really damaging. It's not good for your mental health. I urge really any refugee, not just from Kosovo, but from anywhere to really use services of like going to therapy, um, mental health, especially in refugee communities um, that come from war is not spoken about and not enough. There's stigma within those communities as well for mental health. But I really would um, hope uh, that it, even anyone that's listening to really push themselves um, and really go to therapy because it's helped my family. It's helped, uh, you know, a lot of refugees from Kosovo. And I've, I've been told even by um, medical professionals that 25 years later, because people, uh, Kosovo refugees haven't dealt with their trauma on, 25 years later, their trauma is starting to uh, show. And I know we had the option to go to therapy from the beginning, but very little people took the opportunity to actually do it because it wasn't part of the culture. You didn't learn it in schools mm -hmm. about mental health in the 90s, and it was just part of you know, dealing with each other. Uh, basically, their therapy was like speaking with, with friends and each other, but I definitely urge any uh, refugees or 
any anyone that's left th- their country in a traumatic way, whether it's any type of oppression, um, doesn't have to just be exact war, but there's other things that people flee away from, whether it's domestic violence or, you know, their gender issues and other things. The, the best thing that you can do for your family and yourself is um, go to therapy. And in Canada, we have those options to heal ourselves. I love that you're using <laughs> part of your time today to send that message out into the world for people who have been through trauma of any kind. And, and to say, yes, you know, our journey in, in terms of mental health has come a long way, but we still have a long way to go in terms of people believing that we need to do everything we can for mental wellness. This is a podcast about love. What do you love about being a journalist first? I love that I can give voice to people, um, communities that don't have I like the fact that I, as a woman, uh, um, can have that influence uh, because I live in a country that gives me the opportunity. And even in Kosovo right now, there's a lot of journalists. But when I started doing journalism and when I was like being this geeky writer, there wasn't a lot of women doing journalism and being bold. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why I'm different. But um, I guess I like that I have the option to be who I am, the option that I can express myself and as well as give a, a voice to those that don't have it. Because I remember being in the war and there was courageous journalists uh, risking their life to tell our story. I remember seeing these uh, BBC and... J- journalists uh, in in Macedonia, and I would just like stand by them and just watch them tell the story. I was like, "This is so cool!" And um, I wanted to be telling stories one day to girls who are like me and to people who are like me. If you were to write a letter to Kosovo, a love letter to Kosovo, how would it start? I'm in a better place, even though I'm a part. Um, away from you, even though I parted and was never able to come back. It's kind of like, I use this metaphor um, during the event I was uh, speaking to someone. I said, it's kind of like people who are in love and they separate. And then sometimes they still, they have to separate, but uh, life takes them different directions. But that love may never fade, you know, like those Hollywood movies you see. And so kind of the same for me for Kosovo. Like, I will always have the love for Kosovo. Um, It's my home country. Although we were separated by war uh, and the chaos and the conflict, I still found love in a new place. It may not be the same because Kosovo will always be attached to um, that love that is like painful. It's like the best love, but also painful. And then um, Canada is kind of like that um, peaceful soulmate. <laughs> I don't uh, kind of the metaphor. I'm not sure if I'm using describing it cor- correctly, but oh, it's, it's just amazing. it's just like you know that peaceful part of your life and. Although I will say this, I used to like be so bad, mad at my parents for not going back. And then when I was doing this, the documentary, it just clicked me. I was like, okay. I, and then I, I went to, to my parents. I said, okay, I forgive you guys. Before we wrap up, I want to know more about your documentary. I want people who are listening to know more about your documentary. Yeah, so my documentary was supposed to just be this presentation, to be honest. And then, of course, my Canadian friends were like, Arta, you can do it. You can do anything you want to do. And then so I did it kind of uh, six, like four or five weeks uh, right before the event. So it's just a short, it's not like a full documentary, but it's a short documentary. It's about 15 minutes. And it uh, shows um, our story, how we came and why. 
it shows Canada's response and really uh, there's some footages that, that, that was able to get from Canadian far forces from inside the base that no one had access to, like the media or anybody. So they gave me f footage of, you know, the time um, Canadian army and forces and everyone that sp and volunteers that spent with us inside the base. So uh, that's part of the documentary, as well as shows the contributions of some of the refugees uh, to Canada. And um, so I really wanted to show those parts uh, that, you know, this is where, where we were, how we came, and where we are now. And, and, and all of that is all because of you, really. When we celebrate Canada Day, and, and it has not been uncomplicated, you know, particularly in the past decade or so, as we come to confront in Canada injustices with our Indigenous people, for instance. So it has a different meaning maybe for some, but we say to each other, Happy Canada Day. What will that mean to you this year? For me, it's very uh, grateful uh, because we were we were also given an, a space, an opportunity to celebrate 25 years uh, like we did at Pier 21. Bring There was over 500 people um, attending across Canada. I believe it was close around 500. And um, people even traveled from other places to just be with, with us. And having the platform is a privilege. Uh, having the voice um, is a privilege. So... Yes, I definitely understand it's painful for some and everyone has their own way of gratitude based on how they were personally touched. But um, a country uh, will always have its ups and downs. History will always have, you know, the painful past. Also know that, you know, yes, maybe we're not perfect as, as a country, but Canada has shown um, to being a leader when it comes to helping newcomers, when it comes to, uh, you know, the humanitarianism part uh, of the country. And the, it's doing its part to uh, try and make things better. And as, as you bring up the in indigenous com community, so, uh, it's a great example because um, Canada at least is trying a little bit, you know, to, you know, acknowledge the past mm. and to at least apologize. Truth and reconciliation. Yeah. What do you love most about Canada? Just peaceful, you know, for the most part, you know, obviously, as I said, it has its ups and downs, but I do love Canada that, you know, you can follow your passions, your geekiness like me <laughs> like me and uh like i can be different here i can be the geeky arta if i was in kosovo i would and this is talking 25 30 years ago i would have just had to be this um, typical wife maybe although if i followed my mom's footsteps i probably still wouldn't have been <laughs> um, arta we are so fortunate to have you and your voice and your heart in Canada. Thank you so much. I'm happy that Canada chose us. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to the Canadian Love Map. This podcast is presented and made possible by Charm Diamond Centers. It's hosted by me, Nancy Regan, and is produced and distributed by Podstarter. We love sharing love stories of all kinds, and that could include yours. So do you or someone you know have an uplifting tale to tell? Reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram using at Canadian Love Map or email producer at podstarter.io. We'll be back next week with another love story to add to the map.